You mentioned just now um, with the AML particularly, the survival rates. Could you talk to little, a little bit to us about the survival rate in general for AML and then some of the differences that we may see by age? Sure, yeah, there's a lot of hope I'm gonna say before I give you some of these numbers. So um, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, as we mentioned, 20,000 Americans a year diagnosed, 10,000 approximately dying every year. So a very life-threatening fatal disease in general uh, as, a, as a box. Um, not many risk factors for the disease. There are some families with hereditary features, genetic, and, and we follow a lot of those families. Um, maybe radiation exposure in terms of uh, treatment radiation for other cancers, chemotherapy for other cancers is a clear risk factor. Um, for the disease itself, you're right. Age alone is a huge risk factor for development of AML and prognosis. So the older you are, the more likely you are to be diagnosed and the tougher your outcomes are that age cutoff is roughly something like 65 years and above, but obviously age is just a number. So that's, that's a general cutoff. Uh, more than age is really what we call the performance status, the ECOG performance status, Heather. So that's the overall picture of how someone is. And then of course there are comorbid conditions, kidney disease, heart disease, et cetera. So your age, your prior chemotherapy or cancer history, your organ function and other uh, organ diseases, that really is a kind of way to determine quickly what are your um, outcomes. But with the leukemia itself, Heather, there are some new factors that have really only been around the last five to seven years. In your report, you should ask your doctor about uh, chromosomes or karyotype analysis, cytogenetics, uh, molecular studies, so those are the DNA or genetic changes in the, in the leukemia, not what you're born with, those are genetic, but we're talking about what you've acquired, what you've picked up over time. And so the combination of all of these things, right? So your age, your comorbidities, your cytogenetics, molecular, that gives you and your treating team a chance at what's called prognosis or how to determine what your outcomes are. And, and I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of hope. There are subtypes of leukemia. Many people out there don't know this that are considered better prognosis, so good outcomes. Those are uh, subtypes like APL, acute promyelocytic leukemia. Some of our viewers either are facing that or have family members or know what that is. Core binding factor leukemia, subdivided based on its chromosomes, so on and so forth. There are molecular subtypes as well. Now on the flip side, we also have chromosomes and molecular features that identify high-risk leukemias. And so those are patients who are expected to maybe not do as well as their peers and, and they have a different treatment paradigm. So that's kind of what we're talking about with outcomes and prognosis. Age is a huge factor, but not the only one. That's great, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, I, I know that you just mentioned that there's some leukemias that have better prognosis. I guess I'd like to hear generally about treatments and advances in treatments, uh, specifically for AML that you're really excited about that are coming up? Well, we couldn't be having this interview at a, at a more important time. So just this year of 2020, uh, there have been several new approvals in the um, myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS and AML space. And then in the last two years, seven to eight uh, approvals. So the two key concepts for our viewers will be to know that there are novel oral tar targeted therapies. So that means for the first time in acute leukemia, we have a multitude of drugs now that I can write a prescription for and you're taking by mouth outside of the doctor's office at home under no supervision. We've been doing this for many years, even decades in the chronic leukemias and the MPN. So patients with CML, myelofibrosis, they're already used to that. And then the second concept is the initiation of combining these therapies, Heather, so with other oral therapies or IV chemo. So traditional chemo and the new oral drugs. So there's all these new factors, cost of care, access to care, um, adherence, formerly known as compliance. Are you actually taking the drug the way that it was prescribed? Are you understanding how to take it? And then toxicity, side effects, and, and all the new things that just didn't exist five years ago. 